forgot to mention one other thing. Um, I'm going to do it on the note sheet over here. So this is a question for you, I guess. Um, if f prime of c is equal to zero, does this mean there is a max or a minimum at x equal to c? That's my question for you. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and volunteer an answer to this question, if you like. Does anybody have an answer for me? Or you could type your answer in the chat box. Or if you don't know, that's fine. You don't know. No worries. Anyone have any feeling? Does everybody understand the question? Like, we get that, oh, whenever the derivative is equal to zero, I mean, whenever you have a local max or a local min, the der either the derivative is equal to zero or it doesn't exist. So my question is, is it possible that you have a derivative equal to zero, but it's not a max or min? Terry, you say yes. I agree with you. Can you give me an example? Or can you explain when that would happen? Because you're right. I mean, it's possible. Can anyone think of an example? Let's take a look at a f of x equal to x cubed. When you take the derivative, you're going to get 3x squared. When you set that equal to 0, you're going to get that c is equal to 0. But if you were to look at the graph of x cubed, the graph of x cubed kind of looks like this. It's kind of flatter in the middle, something like that. So what's happening is you got these little slopes of tangent lines over here like this. And when you get to the middle over here, the slope is for a split second, it's horizontal. And then it continues on its journey up and you get these other tangent lines like that. So there is this moment in the middle right here where the tangent line is horizontal, um, but that's neither a max nor a min. So we're going to do a lot in this class, and um, I mean, this particular class today, 11.2. And one of the things we're going to look at is we're going to look at something called concavity. And concavity is like the curvature. So this guy is what we call concave down. It's like cupping downwards. And this part here is what we call concave up. It's kind of cupping upwards. And zero is the point where it kind of switches from concave down to concave up. So that switching point um, is what we're going to call an inflection point later on. And uh, I guess the point is that not every critical value results in a max or a min. There's some that are needed. So um, I want to talk about that soon. That's in 3.3. It's, it's coming up within moments. But before I do that, um, I really want to talk about the idea of absolute maximums and absolute minimums um, on a closed interval. Okay. So, oops. So our methodology for figuring this out is really straightforward. Um, they call it the closed interval method, and I have it written on another page, but I'm going to describe it in words first before I show you the theorem. Basically, if you have a closed interval, like what we have right here, and if your function is continuous, like what we have right here, the theorem says that there's always an absolute maximum, an absolute minimum. Now you really do need the continuity 
Um, if you don't have the continuity, you can create examples where there is no absolute max and absolute min. But once you have that continuity idea, then what do you do? How do you find them? Well, the first thing you do is you find all the critical values. You plug in F into each critical value to see what the Y value is. And then you plug in the two endpoints because the two endpoints could also be absolute maxes and absolute means. The largest Y value gives you the absolute max and the smallest Y value gives you the absolute mean. That's what the closed interval method is. So if you took a look notes over here, you know, your F has to be continuous on a closed and bounded interval I. Bounded just means it's not like zero to infinity or negative infinity to positive infinity. It has to be like two finite numbers. That's what bounded means. Then the, the maximums and minimums occur either at the critical points or at the endpoints. So this just outlines what I said. You find all the critical numbers. You find the values of f at the endpoints. The biggest is the absolute max. Smallest is absolute mean. So let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at an example. Let's take a look at example two. Oh, we already did example two. Um, I guess I'll just step through it. It's continuous since it's a polynomial. Also, if you can take the derivative, that shows it's continuous. So this derivative exists everywhere. The critical value is going to be three halves. So now you just evaluate f at the critical value and at the two endpoints here. Okay. So um, I want you to try that for a So um, I think this one's supposed to be pretty straightforward. I mean, let's just do it, right? So you calculate the derivative. The derivative is going to be 2x. That's easy enough. 2x plus 0, technically. Um, we want to find the critical numbers. To find the critical numbers, just set it equal to 0. So we got 0 is equal to 2c. This tells me that c is equal to 0, right? Divide both sides by 2. So I need to calculate three values. I got f of negative one, f of four, and f of zero. f of zero is the easiest. Zero squared plus three is equal to three. Um, negative one is also easy, right? Negative one squared is one. One plus three is four. And Four is also straightforward. We got four squared plus three. Four squared is 16. 16 plus three is 19. So this is your absolute max. And this is your absolute min. Was there any questions about that? 